Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 12th annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I am Jean Anderson with the South Central Library System, and I am moderating the management track. Assisting me today is Leah Langby with the IFLIS Library System. Thank you, Leah, and we are very glad to have you here. Our presenter for this session is Jocelyn Sansing with the Middleton Public Library here in Wisconsin, who will be presenting Give All Your Power Away, Keys to an Organizational Remodel. As you have questions for Jocelyn, please use the Q&A panel, and we'll save time for them at the end of today's webinar. So Jocelyn, whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Jean. I really appreciate all your hard work in putting this together, and thanks to Jamie for the invite. Um, <clears throat> And there we go, now we're advancing. Um, so um, as the intro mentioned, um, I've worked in public libraries in Montana, Colorado, and Wisconsin um, as an adult services reference librarian, youth librarian, and a public services branch manager. Um, currently, I've been the director of the Middleton Public Library for seven years, and I developed this presentation based on my experience um, in middle management as a director. Um, all of the libraries that I've worked in have all been very, very different. Um, one has been county, one has been special district. Um, they have all been set up and funded differently. And even though their funding structures um, oftentimes determined what the organizational structure looked like, moving through organizational change and remodeling has all been very similar. So whether it was because of changing budgets or new directors um, or uh, adding another location like a branch, um, moving through an organizational restructuring um, has um, been very interesting, both in middle management and now as a director. Um, so before I get started, I do want to say thank you to the Middleton Public Library staff. Um, most of our examples today will focus um, here on Middleton. Um, also a big shout out to the Beloit Public Library. Um, we used a lot of their information and hard work that they did um, moving through something very similar. And then also to the Middleton HR uh, manager, Brian Waldhopter, and the library board. This change is hard and the changes that we make are impacting our organization for generations to come. And so having all of their support through all of this is what really made it happen. So here's what we will cover. Um, why remodel your organization? I like to use the word remodel versus demolition, even though sometimes I have joked about let's blow the whole thing up. Um, I really like to think about the the structure of your organization as a remodel versus a demolition because there's not going to be um, a wipe the slate clean and start all over. There's always going to be things that have worked that you want to carry forward, um, just like as if you were remodeling a house. What are the features that you want to keep? What are the features that you want to build on? What are the things that you want to get rid of that are no longer serving you that maybe did at one point? Where do you want to make upgrades? Um, so it's not so much a demolition as a remodeling. Then we'll look at how uh, what physical design considerations can drive change. Um, here in Middleton, we went through um, a big remodeling of the building, um, and there was a few key things with the service desks that really catapulted the need for a larger organizational remodeling overhaul. And then we'll look at how to choose an org chart structure, um, which one is right for you. Um, there is no wrong or right way to necessarily structure your org chart, but there's um, some things to definitely keep in mind as you're choosing one and looking at what works for your organization. And then we'll look at how to implement intent-based leadership to move the group in the right direction. I like to show this slide a lot in presentations. This is a screenshot of the history page on our website because I think it really sets the stage for the fact that public libraries are always changing and always evolving. Um, just at the Middleton Library, we've gone through about 12 different iterations since 1926. And it's important to keep in mind that 
things will will always be changing. If we're committed to the cause of public libraries, then we'll always be committed to ever evolving and, and always changing. So the last time the Middleton Public Library facility was really changed was um, after the building was built in 1990 and then in 2004, when a lower level was um, renovated and staff um, moved from the lower, the, the main floor um, to also the lower level. So there was a bit of a division that with the staff spaces that happened. Um, and then um, meeting rooms were added and the library basically doubled in size. And since then, the service desks hadn't really been touched and the internet, of course, um, happened in a much bigger way. And our staffing was still looking about the same um, in terms of the reporting structure. So a little bit more about Middleton. Um, we're located west of Madison. We have a population of about 23,000 and it's growing very, very fast. We're part of the South Central Library System. We have about 22,000 card holders. Um, the building right now is 32,000 square feet and we get about 800 to 1,000 visitors a day. So why remodel? Um, the two biggest questions for assessment really need to focus around what improvements do you want to make and what problems do you want to solve? So these were kind of our top five categories of um, how we answered those questions. We wanted to eliminate silos of power and dysfunction by creating a tighter chain of command and reporting structure and support for supervisors. Um, we had uh, not only the challenge of half of the staff downstairs and half of the staff upstairs, um, but the reporting structure um, was such that all of the full-time staff were reporting to the director, which made it very difficult for the department heads to really have um, the authority um, and leadership that they needed to over their teams. Um, we also knew that we wanted to improve um, direct supervision um, up until um, early 2020, the city of Middleton did not have a human resources department. Um, that responsibility was split um, between the city clerk and the city administrator. So once we got the HR manager, I knew that we really needed um, and finally had the resources to help support um, better direct supervision for supervisors. We also knew that we wanted to improve compensation and equity by reclassifying job descriptions. Um, we had quite a few of job descriptions that were really out of date. We also were working with the one, twos, and threes within the pages and the library assistants. And it wasn't very clear as to what the difference was between um, a page one and a page two, or maybe that difference mattered a decade ago, but was no longer relevant. The third was that we wanted to create more opportunities for individual and team engagement um, because, of course, we always want that. Um, this was really um, focused in the areas of programs and service support. We knew we also wanted to reduce redundancies by implementing a new service desk model and universal scheduling. We had three points of service in the building, two of which were only about 15 yards away from each other. So um, we wanted to make sure that we were moving staff around the building so that it was we were dispelling the myths of what happens upstairs versus downstairs and really maximizing not only the staffing, but also the skills of the staff. And then lastly, we wanted to move the director, um, well, this was really me, wanted to move the director as maker um, versus a manager. Um, I found that with the structure that we had and everyone, all of the full-time staff reporting directly to the director, I was making a lot of decisions that either I didn't necessarily have the expertise, the information, or the connections and relationships, or it was a lot of operational things that were slogging down some of the larger, bigger vision things that the board was tasking me with. So in 2018, we endeavored um, with the library board on the next chapter project. We had these three main goals to one, increase the square footage available to the public, um, to create flexible spaces for new ways of gathering and to improve the customer service experiences. Uh, so the third goal really helped to catapult what does 
the customer service experience really look like at the Middleton Library with three points of service? And how can we achieve these other two goals um, by reducing our points to three points of services to two? And what does that mean in terms of the staffing? So anytime we have physical design changes that drive change, um, we look at the um, ways that our jobs are changing. Um, so the biggest things that um, physically changed with the Next Chapter project were the service desk, the stacks, and the meeting rooms. Uh, so we, again, moved from three points of service down to two. Um, we rearranged almost all of the stacks in the building for better lines of sight. Um, we expanded our meeting room capabilities um, along with a lot of other things like flooring and end panels and shelving. So all of this meant that those itemized tasks on the job description didn't necessarily make sense anymore especially when we were moving to an everything at every desk service model. So previously, we would send someone to one desk for downloadable and digital things, then another desk for checking out, and then downstairs for computer help. And if someone had a variety of different questions, they could be up and down the stairs throughout the whole building, and it, would, it was just not a good service model. Um, so the one desk, one service model um, was implemented on every on both floors. So the top left picture, the long triangle or sorry, long rectangle in the middle there was um, what we called the arc de circulation. Um, it was a giant um, desk that was very unapproachable to anyone um, short or a child or in a wheelchair. Um, we queued people up. Um, and then just about 15, 10, 15 yards from that was, uh, or feet from that rather, was the uh, children's reference desk. Um, so that was in addition to a lower level desk that were all staffed differently, they were all um, scheduled differently, and they were all trained for differently. So we consolidated those three points of service uh, into two and then created a 360 degree approach to the main floor desk. So we pulled the desk out from where it was, put it into the middle of the main floor, um, and then had three different approaches to what that desk could offer. Um, we also um, added several self-checks, one in the kids area and another one on the lower level to try to maximize our automation. And then we began the cross-training. Here's a snapshot of our universal schedule. So as we were creating a one for all fill in the blank, whether it was a universal schedule, a uh, one for all training manual for the service desks, um, a one for all way that we onboard, we wanted to create repeatable and documented processes. So we were really building um, in some ways an organization from the ground up as if it didn't exist, but then layering it over top of um, an existing staff and facility. So <clears throat> the universal scheduling was probably one of the biggest things that we did. And this is what that looks like. So we have an internal staff utility page that has um, everything that we need to be able to communicate what's happening at the library um, internally, um, manage our operations, make reservations, et cetera. Uh, we also have a several sets of calendars. One is a list, um, a simply a calendar list of everyone that's working in the building that day, which is something that was sort of a mystery before. We didn't really know who was working where or who was coming and going. It was hard to know what to anticipate and who we could count on. So one calendar that lists the entire staff for the day. The second one is a leave calendar that um, indicates who's on vacation and who's out on sick leave. Um, and th those two calendars talk to each other. And then we implemented the universal scheduling. So down below here um, is a snapshot from Monday. And 
what we did to um, make sense of which person went to which spot was give each of the desks a name. And we named them basing, based on what streets they were facing. So Parmenter Desk faces west towards Parmenter Street. Um, Terrace Desk faces east towards Terrace Avenue. Um, off desk time refers to any training that might be happening off the desk and processing is a separate station in the back. <clears throat> One of the things with the every desk um, model on the main floor was that when people walked into the building, they had um, staff had their backs to the door. So we we know now um, from safety and security trainings that that's um, not only not great customer service, but can also be very dangerous. So that was one very practical thing that we wanted to change. We wanted to be able to have eyes on the door. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we were um, prioritizing customer service over materials processing. So the giant arc to circulation where all of the holds were processed, all of the materials were handled um, except from the sorter, um, has somewhat for the most part moved into or has the capability to scale up and move back into a back processing room where we have a height adjustable table that you can still see out onto the main floor. I'll also mention that all of the service desks, um, all three of them um, that move up and down um, are also um, uh, movable for better ergonomics and accessibility. Um, previously, we would have had a very difficult time making any modifications for a staff member that required a wheelchair. And shortly after we implemented the service desks, we had a staff person who was in a wheelchair post-surgery, and she was still able to work on the service desk, um, whereas before we would have just had to take her off and, and fill that position um, or that, that shift in another way. So that processing happens um, on a larger scale in the back room and I'll, only on the service desk um, as we're able to. So as things get really busy on the main floor, we've got a place where we can put that processing where it can still happen so that everyone on the desk can focus on customer service. The supervisor um, of the day is also very important because um, as we get into the org charts, I'll explain um, that as an example of one of the job descriptions that changed quite a bit. So org charts, um, <clears throat> choose your structure. Um, the structure of your organization um, is a little bit different than the actual chart. The chart is really the graphic representation of what your structure is. And there really is, uh, I've learned, no necessarily right or wrong way to structure your organization. Everyone will look a little bit different. There are seven types of organizational structures and uh, we chose um, the functional. Um, it's important to think about the current roles and um, your, your teams um, when you're pulling charts together. Um, also, how does your strategic plan um, support the org chart or the org chart support the strategic plan? And then what is the feedback from your staff? Um, the feedback and the alignment of the strategic plan are really important um, as you move forward. So one of the things um, that we looked at was um, centralized versus decentralized, hierarchical versus circle, circular, um, vertical versus flat, um, and really looked at what would the benefits be of changing this. So the benefits would provide accountability, clar clarify expectations, um, create a stronger chain of command, and better autonomy um, in decision making for supervisors um, along with department heads. We also wanted to foster more collaboration and create better efficiencies. So the functional or role-based was what we had started with. And here's what it looked like. Um, the library director was in charge of all of the department heads and then all of the librarians that were part of those departments. So one of the first things that I did in about 2017, before we even started the next chapter project was begin with vacancies and moving um, the youth services department around a little bit. So we 
um, as vacancies turned over, moved some of those full-time people underneath the department head, which was a big shift. So that was kind of our entree into initially looking at reorganizing. It also was just a lot of people um, to supervise. I think it was about 10 or 11. Um, and we found that once the department head and youth services really had the um, authority and autonomy to be able to make decisions for their team, we didn't need quite so many um, people in, in, in some regards. So we were able to reduce some redundancies and ultimately um, reduce our overall FTE. Here's what we ended with and what we are currently working with. Um, so we have about two FTE less than where we started. Um, we're at about 24.5 FTE. And the positions that changed the most were from left to right, the administrative librarian moved to a support services librarian. The head of adult services um, supervises an adult services librarian now, along with uh, 1.8 library assistants. The head of youth services oversees the entire youth services department, including full, two full-time librarians and a half-time library assistant. And, and we also took the head of circulation and created a public services deputy director position. I found that especially during the pandemic, um, it was very challenging not to have a second um, or an assistant. Um, if I was tapping into one of the department heads, um, it was very burdensome um, for them to be able to pick up um, assistant director job duties. Um, and they also didn't necessarily have um, that strategic authority and power to be able to make decisions um, for other people's staff as they needed to. So the deputy director um, position was formed and we moved the head of library resources and then all of the supervisors underneath the deputy. So the head of library resources was formerly technical services um, and that person now has their own direct reports. And the supervisors um, are the shift supervisors along with the supervision of the library assistants and the pages. So previously the head of circulation supervised all of the supervisors and the library assistants. So kind of the same um, ch challenges with the flattened organizational chart that I was having as a director that they were having uh, as a circulation head. So this created a lot tighter chain of command and in some ways um, took the flattening of the org chart and um, and looked at how can we create a, a tighter chain with a more formal hierarchy. And then we also took the page ones, page twos, and, and um, and just had pages. Um, and actually the page twos moved up to library assistants. And so we have in our um, staffing chart pages, library assistants, librarians, department heads, director, board. So here's kind of how, the very, very basic bones of how we went about that. Um, first started with the job descriptions. Um, by grouping categories together using a post-it note exercise, um, we took all of the things that deal with, um, for example, building operations. So um, changing out the toilet paper and paper towels to um, what happens if there's a flood and you're the supervisor in charge of the building that day? How do you know how to contact vendors, et cetera? Um, and grouped all of those things together and then looked at how can those groupings be broken down into positions and that's where our groupings for the job descriptions came from. Then I worked with HR to rewrite all of the job descriptions and create some standards um, across all descriptions. So we have a summary, we have essential job functions, um, and then um, those essential job functions are what's included in anything that um, relates to market rate compensation, et cetera. 
So we went through a big reclassifying and, and market rate adjustment compensation plan with the entire city. And it was just very serendipitous timing that that all happened together. Um, it was it was very, it made it very nice because it all happened within the same budget cycle and um, everyone was going to receive their adjustments all together at the same time. Um, we had a lot of staff input um, into some specific decisions. So for example, um, we looked at job titles and um, I was very, very open to suggestions. There was lots of discussion amongst um, the excuse me, current library assistants as to what should they be called, what do, what do you want to be called, what makes sense to the public, tossed around ideas like library navigator or library ambassador, or I think there was a couple others as well, um, but they really liked to stick with library assistant. Um, we also instituted name badges. Um, previously, and even in my first week of work here, I actually went up to um, a staff person on the floor and said, are you finding everything okay? And they were like, yeah, I work here. Um, so having clear name badges to distinguish who is actually an employee um, also helps with safety and security and is just obviously good customer service. Then we built the chart. So here's where I learned a lot about the power, um, the balance of power and influence. Um, at first sight, it might look like it's a good idea to have a director that um, has an assistant director that reports to them, and then all the department heads are reporting to the assistant director. So very, very hierarchical. is probably about as tight as you can get it. Um, but what I learned in reading about org charts and working with our human resources um, manager along with our board president is that we want to have a better balance of power and influence. And we also want to make sure that we're not just recreating um, the same structure, but with another tier. Also wanted to move the authority of decision-making to the right positions. So for example, the shift supervisors were um, in charge of um, essentially the library during their shift, but they didn't necessarily have the um, essential job description functions to be able to make those decisions. And they definitely didn't have the, comp the rate of compensation that they needed for that level of responsibility. So rather than it, you know, a decision that needs to be made um, about closure or um, and sending early everybody home early because of the weather or something like that. Um, the we we change things up so that the supervisor and their job description um, serves as the building authority and is able to make decisions like um, we need to close the lower level um, for from six until eight um, because of staffing shortages or um, because there's something happening downstairs um, with construction or whatever. Um, and they are now empowered to be able to make those decisions um, based on that those changes to the job description. Um, they also have the authority to respond to emergency situations. And by stacking the library assistants and the pages under the two full-time supervisors, those shift supervisors now have the power and authority to be able to actually lead their teams, um, do any corrective action or um, direct work as they need to. Um, one of the big mindset changes that we went through was that we hire people for positions, we don't create positions for people. Um, looking back at a lot of budget documents, um, one of our strategies had been in the past that so-and-so received their master's degree and is now doing professional work, so therefore their position needs to be a full-time librarian. Uh, well, surely you know, there, that that employee is worthy of a full-time position, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's right for the organization. And so th that was a big shift away um, from how we grow um, our staffing um, and that we hire people for the position. We're not necessarily going to create the position for the person. And one of the ways that we've continued to be able to do that and really change that culture was by posting positions. So since we have an HR manager now, we were able to 
post positions um, either internally or externally and everyone interviewed for them. So there's been very few situations where we've promoted people without an interview or um, without some sort of hiring process. Um, those have really been exceptions, not the standard. And then we also wanted to improve the path for employment advancement. Um, this was really something that Beloit um, Public Library did really well on paper. And at looking at their um, path for forward advancement, that was something that was very unclear. How does a page at the Middleton Public Library become a library assistant? How does a library assistant become a librarian? Um, if you started off as a page and knew you wanted to go to library school and be a director, how do you do that? So since we have implemented this new org chart and along with the support of HR, um, we have had 11 promotions since 2022. Um, and those have been probably one of the big things that have really helped to catapult our uh, workplace culture in a positive direction. Then the rollout. So here's where um, it's important to identify the champions. Um, just like with any big major change, there's going to be um, the people that are naysayers, the people that are on the fence, um, that are kind of waiting to see what happens, and then the people that are like on board. And the people that are on board are probably going to be fewer and far between than the other two categories. So it's important to support those um, positions um, as they're carrying a lot of the heavy cheerleading for the whole organization. Um, it's also important to understand that um, whenever you're going through big organizational changes like this, it's always going to be harder for middle management. Um, speaking as a middle manager previously and now as a director, even putting together this presentation, I thought, hmm, have I become one of those directors that creates um, this big change and goes through this big thing and then makes this shiny presentation about it and makes it all look like it's going good? Um, and to a certain extent, yes, because now that I have both perspectives, you know, hindsight is always 2020, and there's always going to be things that the director's going through that maybe they can't share, or they have to keep confidential, or there's external pressures. And the middle management is always going to bear the brunt of the hard and heavy lifting because they're hearing it from both ends. So that's really something to keep in mind is that support the middle management as much as you can. And then choose a communications plan. Um, for this, I chose um, the bullseye communications plan strategy, where we started off with th uh, just a few um, staff in the middle of the bullseye and then rippled out the communications from there. Um, part of the reason that that was chosen was because we didn't necessarily have all of the information available all at the same time. And unveiling the whole thing all at once would have really been total chaos. Um, I will say that this was probably the trickiest and most challenging piece um, from my perspective, and I would guess from all of ours, because we were also doing this in 2021 as we were reopening from COVID. So it was already chaos. Um, when we were looking at how do we roll this out um, what is our willingness and readiness for this type of organizational change? Um, it was very low. Morale was very low. We were tired. We were burnt out just like everybody else after having gone through curbside and trying to reopen and figuring out what that meant. Um, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't worth doing and that it wasn't the right thing to do. So the bullseye communication plan um, was something that was great in theory, maybe not have has worked the as as well as um, the board and HR and I had hoped it would. Then we looked at training. So <clears throat> if we're going to change the job descriptions and have every buddy working at every desk, then everybody needs to know how to do everything. Um, 
but to what degree do they need to know that and how do they learn it? So we went through a back to basics training where our circulation staff trained our librarians and library assistants and youth and adult services on how to check out books, basic circulation, and then vice versa, um, youth and adult services trained circulation staff on readers advisory and databases and downloads. Um, that is something that we're still working on. It will always be a work in progress, just like training always should be. So that cross-departmental training was really for the staff by the staff and is something that we're continuing to build on. The team structure for crossover services and shared budgets is something that we were stepping towards, but really, again, catapulted in a big way with the reorg. So one of the things that really um, was troublesome with from a budgetary standpoint was that we were very redundant or even sometimes um, overshadowing or competing with ourselves with either programming funds or even just programs in general. So we moved to a programming team model and a shared budget. So instead of having a separate budget for youth services and a separate budget for adult services, we have one account and then we um, designate funds within that account um, out to those departments. And then the last thing we did for training, um, and again, this is a work in progress and ongoing as well, was support, support for performance. Um, we have um, a annual performance review process that happens through the municipality. And we've really moved towards um, more of a coaching and mentoring strategy where all of the direct um, reports are meeting with their direct supervisor on a regular basis rather than just once a year. So then that annual review process becomes really a summary and a celebration of performance, not a time to pop surprises on people about what they're doing wrong or what they should be doing, um, which is never a good thing. So this all sounds fine and good, but how do you really get this to happen? Um, so I learned a lot about intent-based leadership throughout this process. And intent-based leadership creates an environment for people to contribute so they feel valued and encouraged to reach their potential. And it's about designing an environment to where people give intent to each other and they feel valued and proud of their work. Um, and again, that all sounds fine and good, but what does that really what does that really mean? How do you really get from us plus them to equal a we? Um, how do we get from we to teamwork without any blame or recrimination? Um, how do we understand what each other's jobs are um, without overstepping and taking over? David Marquet, and this is listed in the resource list, is really one of the thought leaders around um, leadership with intent. And there's two images that I'll share with you that really helped me um, figure out how to do this. Um, so when we say give all your power away, what does that really mean? And I say all within parentheses because you'll need to look at um, the tuning of control along with competency and clarity. So the control is, is it safe? Is it safe to have a full-time supervisor fully in charge of the building? And the competency and clarity, is it the right thing to do? So is it safe um, for that position to have that level of authority and responsibility? And is it the right thing to do as in, are they getting paid enough to make those decisions? Um, is it the right person for the job? Do they have the competency um, to be able to do that? And is the clarity of expectations there for them to be able to get the job done? So this is oftentimes where um, you, will, you will have problems with um, understanding how much um, power and control to give at a certain time. And it's important to remember that the biggest problem isn't necessarily the work that needs to happen, and it's definitely not your direct reports. The biggest problem in most of these situations is always going to be you. Um, it is very challenging to get out of your own way. 
I really love the ladder of intent because this really gives a good visual as to how do we really break this down. So <clears throat> if you are getting questions like, um, okay, I have the responsibility to do this now, but what do you, what do you want me to do about it? Or you're going to have to tell me because I can't read your mind. Um, I can't read your mind. You need to tell me what you want. Um, maybe what the goal is, is actually um, unknown. We don't necessarily know what that looks like yet. Um, so how do you move through that unknown together? Um, can't you just make a decision? Why, why do we have to talk about this for three meetings? Why can't you just make a decision? Um, okay, tell me step by step how you want this done. Um, what should I say to them about this? You wanted me to talk to them about their performance in um, this thing. How do I do that? I don't know what to say. Um, I don't didn't know that you wanted it done that way or by then. So some of these are just clarifying expectations, but some of them are also really looking at, you have the authority and the power now as the department head or the supervisor, or even a leader within your page group to be able to make decisions. And we work up the ladder to be able to do that. So a lot of times um, we'll always start at the bottom. Um, sometimes people will catapult right to the top um, or they'll be ready for it, but other times we'll need to work the ladder. So a lot of times this will start off as, okay, tell me what to do. This is direct um, me giving the directive and then that person reporting back. Then we want to move away from that because the director doesn't need to be making decisions about scheduling. So you need to get out of your own way and look at, okay, how can we get that person to, I see, I'm seeing that these are, this is what's happening. Um, and how do I do that without any judgment about the situation or about how one of my coworkers is doing it? Then we move up to, I think this is what I would like to do about this. I would like to do about this. Both of those are still asking for permission. If a supervisor is in a situation where something is happening in the building and they need to be able to make a decision because now they're the person in charge, I don't want them to have to text or call me to say, I think I'd like to do this. I would like to. I would like them to be able to make that decision and trust that they're going to do the best that they can. And I would rather have um, then be able to take that risk responsibly. Um, and we can talk about it afterwards if it didn't go well, rather than um, having to wait and not necessarily know what to do when they could be capable of handling the situation. So really the goal is we want to get to the I intend to and I've done and I've been doing. So a great example of this is with our programming team. So um, they've twice, um, two times, um, two years in a row now have had a planning retreat. Um, I do not necessarily need to be at the planning retreat, but I talked to staff, um, the staff um, department heads before then, and I am asking them, what are you intending to do? What are, what's, what's on the plan? Um, and then they give me their intention back. Here's what we're intending to do. Um, I might have more questions about that. And that's where um, a lot of the um, fine tuning can happen with that competency and control, but they're really giving me an update and report on what they're doing. I'm not giving them the directive on you need to do this program or I want to see this happen. Um, I'm giving them intent and they're giving me the intent back. And this is really the ultimate goal with any level of the organization, whether it's a page or a library assistant or the director and the board. I'm telling the board, here's what I'm intending to do. Um, here's the action item on the agenda. The page is saying to their supervisor, um, I'm intending to do this, build this cart. I'm intending to go do this. Um, maybe the supervisor asks some questions back and then uh, we have leaders within each rank of the organization. <clears throat> so <clears throat> because of all of this, we have gotten to a place where we are able to be more resilient 
Um, when, and part of this is also just surviving the pandemic, um, what seemed like a really big deal before of closing the lower level, um, is not necessarily a big deal now. We have a repeatable documented process on how to handle that. And we have the people in charge being able to feel empowered to do it. Uh, we have a sustainable staffing structure. Um, we know where we're going in terms of growth within the org chart. It's not just based on an individual or one employee, um, or a particular skill set. It's based on the organizational needs. And perhaps most of all, we have a positive attitude and a positive morale across the whole organization. We're aware of what each other is doing because we are working the desks throughout the whole building. We have teamwork across departments, and we're able to say yes to things like a bookmobile later this year. So here are some cliches that helped me along the way that um, you may find helpful as, as well. Um, commit to the long game. Um, we started this really from the very, very beginning back in 2017. Um, the big changes happened in 2021 with everything turning over at the January 1st um, with the new job descriptions and compensations rates in 2022. And now here we are in 2024. This is long, hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, there will be some people along the way that are not on board. Um, there will be a lot of growing pains, um, but the end result is worth it. Say yes to fun. Um, we were not having a lot of fun. Um, I even checked out a book on how to have fun. Um, and how to refine your fun after the pandemic. Um, one of the best ways that we've had fun is really leveraging the enthusiasm and positive rapport that the programming team um, has brought to the organization. So as they create programs for the public, they also are creating um, a supplemental or additional complementary option for staff to participate. So that staff can also do the paint pouring program. Um, um, as supplies are available, that staff are also invited to participate in the winter reading and the summer programs. Um, so, and that and this is on staff. This is on shift time, not necessarily like coming to a program on your own. Of course, that's always encouraged too. Um, so, say yes to the fun, even if it costs a little bit more money. It's always worth it. Um, it creates a, a better vibe, um, which is one of our words for 2024 is vibes. Um, and it just really creates a play, a feeling that you can't, you can't say that this is going to be a mandate. We're going to have this great feeling in the library when you walk in, but it's one of the most common compliments that we receive on a regular basis from the public is, wow, it just feels good in here. And so saying yes to the fun is part of letting it feel good. Empowerment itself is not a program. Um, you have to create standards um, for excellence and standards for service, and that comes along with the job descriptions, the manuals, the checklists, the ongoing training. It's great to say you're empowered to make those decisions, but that in and of itself is not a program. Be okay with getting it right versus being right. Um, even as you know, as a director, I am not necessarily married to my ideas or vision. I am more concerned about getting it right. And so this is where being able to share feedback um, in all directions can be really helpful. We are a work in progress and we're learning every day. We will let each other down. We will make mistakes. Um, being okay with not being right, but getting it right is all part of the learning process. And we're all allowed to be a work in progress. And then lastly, it's important to remember that success is actually an illusion. There is no success summit that we reach and we are like, yes, we've achieved it. We're done. We're here. We've arrived. Um, it is always a mirage in the distance. And that in and of itself can feel exhausting and lead to burnout. Um, once you reach that pinnacle of success, then what? You have to reach it again and reach it again. So instead of looking at success as a destination, success is a journey. And it's all about fine tuning towards mastery. 
throughout the pandemic and even now, um, one of our mantras is go slow and be deliberate. Um, this allows us to be thoughtful about our interactions with each other, um, with how we're approaching services, how we're delivering those services to the public, so that truly we are one mission, one organization. Here's our list of resources. The David Marquet website is a great place to go for more on the leading with intent. Um, Forbes um, has a great article on organizational charts with examples. Uh, David Lewis and Riley Mills wrote a great book on the bullseye principle. Um, and then we just started as a municipality uh, beginning the Baldridge Foundations of Communities of Excellence. So I delved into this a little bit when I was researching and looking at creating repeatable and documented processes as we were beginning the reorg and really found that while the uh, Baldridge um, metrics in general can be overwhelming in a lot of work. There's a lot of really, really great nuggets to be able to um, take away as you're looking at, is this a repeatable process and what are the outcomes that we want to achieve? And then of course the um, classic crucial conversations. So with that, I would love to open it up to any questions. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I mean, we do have a, a few questions, um, and I did not know about the bookmobile thing, so I'll have, to, I'll have to ask you more about that. And there was a question about it, but I'll save that one for a minute. Um, the first question, um, let me get back to it, was um, in your org chart, you mentioned FTEs and whatnot. Do you have a, an idea or a sense of, uh, I don't know if you have the exact numbers at the top of your head, um, about your full-time versus part-time staff? How many of of each. We had FTEs, but I know that's sure. like 1.4 um, equals however many people. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, you know, I should know this because we're filling this out for the annual report right now. Uh -huh, you are. Um, I believe it, I believe it's 11 or 12 FT full-time staff and then the rest are part-time. Um, we have a total of 24.5 FTE. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, the next question was, uh, do you have any advice for a library that wants to restructure, but has many longtime staff who are very resistant to change? Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is um, not uncommon whatsoever, um, especially because we have very high job satisfaction in libraries. So we have a lot of longevity. Um, this is where looking at the mindset of remodeling and renovation versus demolition um, can be very helpful. Um, there, there is a tipping point where if you are the decision maker and you're leading through change, um, you can be compelled to to make those things happen. Um, that is always the last thing that you want to do. Um, so hearing what the concerns are and addressing what support would look like for that. So um, we've actually done this in meetings, um, not recently, but in the past, um, gone around and shared, okay, we're gonna start this big thing. What are our biggest, what's your biggest fear? Um, you know, my biggest fear is, um, um, not being able to do my job or not knowing how, or my biggest fear is losing, losing that thing that I really love to do. I really love to do that, that piece of my job. And if we change towards this model, then I might not get to do that anymore. Um, so then getting all of the fears out there and then addressing them one by one as what would support for that look like? Um, would, it, would it make sense to still have that person be the backup for that thing that they really loved? Or um, where could you find some, some common ground that is still what is, has the best intent for the library in mind? Um, so those are probably kind of the two biggest things is um, the mindset of remodeling and polishing things up, not demolition. Um, and slicing and dicing, um, and then addressing what those fears look like. And that doesn't have to be in a group meeting. It can more easily happen in one-on-ones. 
Um, thank you. Um, and then a, a follow up question um, to that. In, um, <clears throat> do you have any advice for libraries with a majority of part time employees, for example, two full time and 10 part time? Does that change the um, any advice on that? Go slow. I know. Go slow. Yeah, okay. go slow. Because um you know, the full-time people are living it every single day. The part-time people are dipping in and out. And those, that continuity um, is just going to take a lot longer um, to get everybody moving in the right direction altogether. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then <clears throat> in the beginning, I think you had said you have, you ended up after the reorg with um, two fewer FTEs as a result of the remodeling. Mm -hmm. um, how did that happen? Was that just like natural attrition? Did that, um, mm -hmm. was that through vacancies and things? Yep. Through, um, through vacancies and, and natural attrition. Um, we had at one point, um, this had changed before I started, but we had three department heads within youth services. So it was sort of this like um, three-headed monster. Um, each of the department heads was um, responsible for a particular age group. And so it was very, it was like a silo within a silo. And so that was one area where we looked at letting go of one of the FTEs um, pretty early on. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, uh, let's see. And then the follow up to that, it was so if natural attrition, if that was the case, how did you make that work with the structure and then having the right person for the job for each job that you created? Did, was there a lot of movement um, amongst your existing staff to doing different, different tasks and different positions and job titles and things? Um, yes and no. Um, so one of maybe one an example that can answer that question is um, like within our IT department. Um, so we have one person in IT um, and he was doing um, all of the newsletters and also um, a lot of things for the friends group. And so when we looked at um, that post-it note exercise where we're grouping um, categories of things together, the newsletter fell way outside of the realm of IT stuff. And so that was shifted under to a department in, pos in positions that actually made sense. Um, so while a lot of this shifting is happening, um, that can happen before the actual job descriptions change. Um, you can also pilot something for a specific period of time. So for the next three months, let's have this one um, employee do these tasks as it relates to their job description to see if we can get them up to speed with their skills or if they're the right person or they are the right person. Um, and then it gives you an option to be able to back out or to build off of. Um, so the shifting of duties and responsibilities can happen at any point in time. It doesn't have to happen all at the same time, um, like on the date that you choose. We're going live with this. That's uh, um, That sounds like chaos to do it all. Like everything is changing on January 1st mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And that's where, that's where you're, you are, that's where the intent comes back and forth. So mm -hmm. um, as the leader, you can say, you know, lead in, in a way that um, I'm intending to um, get more, give more support um, in this arena and shift these duties and responsibilities over here for this period of time. And we're going to, and I'd like to try this. What do you think? Um, and then, then staff can offer feedback back. Well, um, you know, really, we need to do this first before we can do that. And so that's where a lot of back and forth happens. Um, that can also be messy and somewhat painful because it's also very unknown. And it's also um, can be disruptive. But if you make it make it clear with clear expectations as to how and why and when and for how long this is happening, um, most oftentimes people will rise to the challenge because if we're creating an environment where we're leveraging people's skills and creating more empowerment, then what we're really saying is we believe in you that you can do this task. Um, let's try it out for this amount of time and we'll see how it goes. I like that idea of the pilot um, projects, a pilot um, 
to test things out and think how, see how things work and whatnot. And it also really sounds like you involved um, all of your staff and your management team into this process. It wasn't just you um, thinking of all of the, you know, I mean, you, I'm sure you had an overall thing, but it sounds like you had a really good feedback loop with your, with your team to make this all be successful. Well, as best as we could. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, I know. During yeah. the pandemic. Yep. yep. <laughs> With all the tools say, we had it. Yep, I would say it's much better now than it was then. Um, yeah. And like I said, you you will make mistakes. You have to forgive yourself, um, forgive others, and know that if you have the one mission, one organization um, at the top of mind and everybody's working towards it, then you can't go wrong even, even if you're failing. Mm -hmm. Yep, as long as you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we are just at 3.30, so I'm going to just read one last um, thank you. Um, uh, there's a thank you that says, just a thank you. I'm in the beginning phase of remodeling our organization, and your information was just what I needed. So um, so thank you so much, um, Jocelyn, for a great session today. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar and will also be sent to your email, and we really appreciate your feedback. This was our last session for today. Uh, we begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow with tracks in programming and internal communications. Registration for these sessions is still open. Have a great rest of your day and thanks everyone. Thank you and thanks to the Middleton staff. <laughs>